Welcome to Planet Sleep. I'm your host, Josh, and in tonight's episode, I'm going to be taking you to one of the most remote yet beautiful locations in the entire world. Tonight, we'll be visiting the Galapagos Islands. Before we go, though, I want you to take a moment to relax. Close your eyes if you need to, and just take some deep breaths in through the mouth and out through the nose. It's important to center ourselves and prepare our minds for this most relaxing journey. Now that we're relaxed, let's go. Winding sea currents converge in the Eastern Pacific. Waves crash along the coast of volcanic rock where overcast skies match the achromatic crust of a curious archipelago before you. A chain of islands only colors rest upon strewn vegetation and the rare wildlife that colonizes its shores. A remote birthing ground a beautiful beacon of evolution where mother nature rolled the dice on the table of life here rallies the ancient tortoises international seedlings and the birds whose slight variation in beak size crack the code of our own biological history the galapagos in its breath of intrigue exists as the planet's greatest natural experiment Formed by the unrelenting volcanic activity deep below the ocean's surface, the Galapagos Islands emerged from the Pacific waters some 14 million years ago. From the hot womb of the earth, intense heat and pressure forced a land of new life out into the cold, cold world. A hot spot beneath tectonic plates released magma through the small fissures. The bursting gourds of new rock spewed their molten heat between the cracks as the cool ocean water solidified each bit of crust. Here meager underwater islands developed at first, constantly billowing under the spew of magma, until the formations grew large enough to finally break the surface of the ocean waters. Roughly 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, these islands straddle the equator in diverse patterns dictated by ancient volcanic activity. For millions of years, these volcanoes disgorged new earth and still do to this day. The islands themselves lend us a lesson in patience and fate. Where there was once nothing but eager magma knocking on the ocean floor, leagues below the surface, fast forward 14 million years, and nature presents us with the Earth's largest petri dish. Thirteen large islands and several smaller ones make up the archipelago, and today the eastern series of islands no longer harbor active volcanoes, yet some of the volcanic craters left behind have become shelters for aquatic wildlife. The western islands remain active. Although rare, volcanic activity still threatens certain wildlife residing on the western islands. As any newborn island formed in the middle of a vast ocean, as vacant and empty as a fresh canvas waiting to be filled by the color of wildlife, how life came to be on these islands is a result of mere coincidence. Much like any other spark of existence, the painter's brush is first dipped in water. Life within the Galapagos owes much of its existence to a series of underwater sea currents that travel from across the ocean, meet together, and dictate life and death upon the islands. Like a set of jurors deciding on capital punishment or flourishing life, islands of a thousand dead iguanas or a thousand blooming daisies. If it weren't for these currents, where the Earth's equator typically holds the holy smite of a hot sun, they offer relief for the creatures on these volcanic islands. The Humboldt Current a cold south equatorial current greets the Galapagos from the west, where it brings nutrients that feed plankton and vegetation of the sea. Contributing to the genesis of life surrounding the islands, 
This current also brings a crucial amount of fish, a staple for a bird's diet. And the birds of the Galapagos, well, as simple-minded as some of them are, would unwittingly become the catalyst for every single aspect of life on the Galapagos by doing nothing more than pooping. The first feet to land upon the Virgin Islands of the Galapagos were skinny and bright blue, cold and leathery. No, they were not the feet of a dead sailor washed ashore by the currents. On the contrary, they were brought by air, under wings of a bird as dumb as its name, the blue-footed booby. The birds who traveled from the Ecuadorian mainland used these desolate islands of the Galapagos as a resting place between travels, a journey of at least 600 miles with rarely a rock in sight. The barren islands were nothing more than a brief refuge, long before they became the birthplace of Darwin's theory of evolution. They were dark, rigid, and pelted by the violent ocean. Magma spewed and solidified, a place reminiscent of the earliest days of Earth. Billions of years ago when land had finally met sea, with not a tree to be seen, or a seed to be sown. Eventually as the sea currents worked their magic, they brought a stockade of fish to the shores of the Galapagos. These meandering, blue-footed birds began using the islands for feeding locations. And once the birds recognized the potential for a reasonable habitat on the island, many of them wished to find a mate and settle down. This was fresh, new real estate within the Pacific, and these birds would be the first of many colonizers of the Galapagos. Unfortunately, the barren islands of the early Galapagos offered no proper vegetation for building nests to lay eggs. And so the prospects of these adventurous birds quickly dissolved. Although the islands were rich in nourishment brought by the sea currents, the birds couldn't make the islands their home no matter how ample the food sources were. Many of them took their leave, continuing to use the islands as only a resting place and nothing more. Yet their wishes would cultivate soon enough. By an act of fate, these birds carried within their stomachs the seeds of their future, or more accurately, the seeds of vegetation. Consisting of a mix of berries and plant seeds that the birds had once consumed while on the Ecuadorian mainland. These seeds were then carried across the ocean inside the bird's digestive tracts and were eventually airdropped onto the barren rocks of the Galapagos Islands. Some of these seeds, despite the harsh environment of dry volcanic rock, settled their way into the earth as the sea currents brought them nutrients. Many of the seeds withered and drifted away, yet some of the lucky ones found their place. With all the indiscriminate pooping of seabirds, it was only a matter of time before vegetation began to sprout. Like monkeys bashing on typewriters, the words of Shakespeare find their way onto the page. And so, these once barren islands began seeing their first signs of color. Not exactly lush green, but gray and brown, the likes of a desert. The lush greenery of the Galapagos would only be found in the wetter highlands, whereas hardier cacti and leafless shrubs riddled the drier, rockier areas. Plants with a higher tolerance to salty conditions began appearing along the coast, such as the mangrove tree, whose branches became a suitable environment for several species of birds to finally nest. In brackish waters of ocean salt water, beside rocky soil and crashing waves, these mangroves lined the shore of an environment where most trees couldn't or wouldn't ever dream of growing. These trees tolerate up to a hundred times the amount of salt than most trees can, and grow from almost no soil at all, a perfect match for the primordial shores of the Galapagos. Their arching root systems ascend through the volcanic rock and ocean water and tower above the ill-suited coast, allowing the roots to absorb their oxygen from the air. These root systems protect many smaller species from predators, as they can grow in a peculiar shape, a small hut, or cage formation with walls of dense curling roots. Their exposed roots widen below the trunk and dig deep into the earth. Despite the horrid saltwater conditions for most plants, many of these mangroves have the ability to filter up to 97% of the salt from the ocean water 
and retain this water by growing waxy leaves. These habitats are so well established in the Galapagos, we can assume any given congregation of mangroves have been there for thousands of years. With a suitable habitat now available by the mangroves, the first birds of the Galapagos had made their nests from leaves and other remnants of the newest vegetation to grace the islands. As soon as they would lay their eggs, small beaks would crack through their shells in hunger. And thus the first colonists of the Galapagos Islands had settled down, and the first generation of birds were born upon their new molten world. Along the coast of the Espanola Island, the southeasternmost island of the Galapagos, ocean waves gently flow along a smooth beach of fine coral and volcanic rock. One peculiar bird proudly struts across the sand, showing off his gaudy blue feet to the female birds around him. For if there is to be a next generation of hatchlings on this new molten world, he must first attract a mate. So proud of his bright blue feet, he lifts his webbing high and makes certain every female in the vicinity can see just how bright they really are. The appropriately named blue-footed booby stumbles his way along the coast with not much on the mind besides his feet. It is believed their name comes from the Spanish word bobo, meaning stupid, as these birds are simple creatures of simple behaviors, and their obsession with their own feet contributes to their navel-gazing attitude. They are so simple, in fact, that unlike many exotic birds who typically must clean their housing space and put on an entire show for their prospective mates, the female boobies pick their mates almost entirely on the basis of whose feet are the brightest and bluest of them all. A superficial bunch, not to mention ageist, as the older males often have the dullest looking feet. Once they are out of their prime, not even a great personality can help them in the mating game. Almost half of all breeding blue-footed boobies on the planet exist within the Galapagos. Due to the select species that live there, the ample amount of fish, and the vast amount of coastal habitats, the Galapagos Islands make an appealing environment for the booby to make its home. We have much to thank these birds for, no matter how dumb, self-obsessed, and superficial they are. It was these birds, and birds like them, who first brought life to the surface of the Galapagos. An accident, yes as Columbus found the New World and thought it was the Indian Spice Islands. These birds ignited what would become one of the most significant biological locations on the planet. As for the first human feet to reach these shores, we aren't entirely sure. Archaeological evidence shows that these islands have been explored by humans in pre-colonial times. As for exactly who these people were, we have no record of. The first documented source of humans discovering the islands was in 1535 by a Spanish sailor named Tomas de Berlanga. And again, as with many of the historical events of the Galapagos, this was by mere accident. The winds had died while he sailed across the ocean on his way to Peru, and by the force of our friends, the ever-flowing currents surrounding the islands, and his ship was pushed towards the volcanic rocks. Hmm, interesting, he thought. Yet only interesting enough to where these monumental islands would appear on the ocean maps some 30 odd years later. Perhaps there wasn't much to note at the time, or his journey to Peru occupied too much of his mind. The two men who finally documented the islands outside of its mere existence were Abraham Ortelius and Gerardus Mercator two historical staples in the map-making realm, and they were the first to note the impressive number of tortoises on the islands. And by the habitation of these hard-shelled giants, the islands were given their names. Insole de los Galapagos, or Island of the Tortoises. This would be the first recognition of anything close to importance upon the islands, and continues to be one of the most iconic aspects to this day. Beyond its discovery and honorable mentions in world maps, the island's first human inhabitant wouldn't arrive until 200 some later in 1807. Much like the dumb birds before them, sailors had used the islands only as a quick stopover between journeys. 
Once sailors caught wind of the island's ample supply of giant tortoises, sailors would hunt them for their long-lasting meat that could survive long journeys across the ocean, yet much unlike the dumb birds before them. These sailors contributed nothing to the biological growth of the islands. All they did was pillage and sail on, continuously shrinking the number of tortoises across the Galapagos. Not even their poop contributed. Their sea dog diets of briny beef, filthy water, and ship biscuits had nothing to offer the islands. All they offered to the Galapagos was a man by the name of Patrick Watkins, a man unwanted by the islands, but its blooming wildlife sheltered him for two years until he found his escape. In 1807, he was first abandoned by his crew for reasons unknown on the island of Floriana, a small island on the southern end of the archipelago, where its flat land offered fresh water and plentiful wildlife. It had been a popular stop for whalers for its resources and ease of access, and also a place to maroon unsavory crew members. Not 30 years after Watkins' stay, Charles Darwin would visit the same island of Floriana and note the sheer lack of native tortoises there. In fact, there were none at all. Whalers and other passerbys had completely wiped them out. And Watkins, as we can imagine, helped contribute to this loss. He lived on the island for two years and grew vegetables on a two-acre tract of land within a small valley. He often traded his island goods with the sailors who stopped by, as he often exclusively sought the delicacies of rum to pass the godforsaken time. He also used this rum to trick sailors into his command. A clever ruse. He entertained the traveling sea dogs and got them drunk enough to where they would pass out on the island. In the meantime, their ships disembarked and sailed off into the Pacific. After the abandoned crewmate woke with a nasty hangover, in a haze of confusion, Watkins explained to the man how his shipmates had left him behind, just as his own crew had done to him. And then he would convince them to pledge loyalty to him. Watkins pulled the same ruse on not one, but three men in total. With a veil of liquor over their eyes and quick tongue to deceive them, Watkins became a leader of this ragtag group of abandoned drunkards. With a bit of team effort, the four of them eventually stole a small boat from an anchored ship off the coast and headed towards the Ecuadorian mainland. After two years, Watkins was finally free. They successfully escaped from the volcanic shores of the Galapagos, but those that would reach the mainland would only be one of them. As if we'd be surprised by the actions of a man who was marooned by his own men and conned his way back to civilization. The boat that returned to the shores of Ecuador only carried Watkins aboard. Rumors circulated that he had murdered the others as their supply of fresh water ran low. Much later, Patrick Watkins was later arrested in Peru, hiding beneath a small boat ready for launch, and he was imprisoned on charges of being a suspicious character. By then, he had fallen in love and wished for nothing more than to return to the archipelago from which he was once so abandoned. After that, he was never heard from again. What Watkins left behind on the shores of the Galapagos, besides his own filth, empty rum bottles, and his history of bamboozles, was a very tangible omen of mankind's wake of destruction. Without much regard for the island's well-being, these islands were only seen as a place to drop off no good men and pillage the natural resources into extinction. Luckily for the wildlife of the Galapagos, much of it can not only withstand the atrocities of man, but also the violence of Mother Nature herself. Unfortunately, the affairs of Mother Nature are not always kind to themselves. As seasons change, the surrounding sea currents change with them, meaning that the amount of fish brought by the various currents ebb and flow alongside the ocean currents. For every decline in the availability of food, a bleak future awaits. In times when they can barely feed themselves, a pair of blue-footed boobies raising their young are faced with the most dire decision of their parenthood. In these moments of food scarcity, the parents often cannot catch enough fish to feed all their young. So the eldest always receives what the little parents can find. 
while the youngest, sometimes more than one, slowly dies of starvation. Unfair, Mother Nature may be at times, so the boobies must do whatever it can to secure at least one of their offspring to live. The populations of these birds diminish during these seasons, and in the meantime they must tighten their belts and wait for the next surge of fish. Their nests often line the coast, sometimes in great numbers where dozens of parents must protect their young from various egg hunting species, snakes and hawks being primary egg predators on the shore. Their cluttered nests create a giant maze along the beach, and any passerbys meandering into this territory of egg sitters receive threatening pecks from the pointy beaks of protective blue-footed boobies. One such beachcomber, constantly running into their neighbor's nurseries, is the Galapagos marine iguana, believed to have reached the remote Galapagos Islands by way of floating logs. These scaly reptiles enjoy their time on the sunbathing beaches of these rocky islands, which often overlap the same real estate as the blue-footed boobies. So the agile lizard must be careful in its journey along the shore. Yet, the marine iguana has little to no interest in eggs. Just another fact unknown to the dim-witted bird, one of a mile-long laundry list. This lizard species, unique for its ability to dive into the ocean, feeds primarily on algae. Therefore, they have learned to dive up to 100 feet into the ocean and can remain underwater for almost an hour. No other iguana on the planet has this unique ability, and these animals are found nowhere else on Earth. They are completely exclusive to the Galapagos Islands. So perhaps the egg-sitting booby might believe he's protecting his nest by pecking at the passing iguana, but he's really only causing a neighborhood disturbance for the iguana trying to reach his favorite sunbathing rock along the shore. The predatory bird the marine iguana must be on the lookout for is the Galapagos hawk. Quick, large, and strong, these birds can swoop down and snatch an iguana in mere seconds. Luckily, from the help of another neighbor, one friendlier than the blue-footed booby or the hawk, the nearby finches give out a wry call whenever they spot a hawk in the area and the marine iguanas have learned to recognize this distinct call. Once the marine iguana dodges the course of birds, he reaches his perch on the warm rock grass. He sits patiently as waves gently crash around him. The water soothes him, and the sun warms him. He watches his peers dive for algae off the coast, and in the meantime he raises his head, points his tiny nose away from himself, and shoots a blast of thick salt water from his nostrils down the side of the rock. Not to be rude, but he must rid his body of salt water. Being a creature of the ocean shore and feeding on algae naturally fills the iguana with unwanted salt water. So the lizard has developed a highly efficient salt glands to discharge saline through the nose. Although a bit absurd, this behavior is crucial for the survival of marine iguanas. And this is one of the many defense mechanisms for survival on the Galapagos. Although the island shores create an ideal habitat for the iguanas and the sea currents bring nutrients, their environment is not always so kind. The sea currents converging near the Galapagos are not only the region's givers of life, but also its harbingers of death and destruction. While the Humboldt current brings nutrients in cold water, the formidable El Nino current brings warm water often due to the atmospheric changes over the Atlantic. The Humboldt, along with the La Nina current, more often than not bring enough cold water to counter the warmer water brought by El Nino, maintaining the water's temperature surrounding the Galapagos. Yet as seasons change, so do the cycle of water currents. During a strong El Nino event, the warmer water overwhelms the islands as the other currents recede. This change in temperature results in massive declines in population for the surrounding ocean life, including sardines, krill, and algae, crucial specimens that provide nourishment for many animals of the Galapagos. And while aquatic animals such as whales can simply relocate elsewhere in the ocean to find a new source of food, the animals confined to the islands such as the marine iguana are subject to its shores, and they have become completely dependent on the supply of algae. 
El Nino not only dictates food supply in the Galapagos, but affects weather patterns along the coast of northern, central, and South America. Occurring roughly every five years, the El Nino event's aftermath brings restorative rainfall as well as absolute devastation. In one El Nino event alone, almost 70% of all marine iguanas on the Galapagos had perished from starvation, leaving behind the dry skeletal remains of countless lizards along the island shores. Because of their limited geographical existence, exclusive to the Galapagos, this means that one single natural event can wipe out the majority of this species' entire population in one season. From what currents give to these islands, they also take away, and Mother Nature continues its stern balance of life and death in the eastern Atlantic. For the resilient marine iguana, these highly adaptable creatures have survived time and time again through the devastation of countless El Nino events. During times of starvation, the iguanas have the ability to shrink in size, sometimes up to 20%. This reduction means they need less intake of food. In these times of reduced algae, the iguanas may get desperate. And it's times like these when the overprotection of the blue-footed boobies doesn't seem as foolish as it once was, or the stomach grumbling lizards might be desperate enough to finally feed on eggs. Although not part of their regular diet, desperate times call for eating your neighbor's young. And even when there is absolutely no nourishment to be found, and the iguanas begin to die off in astounding numbers, during mating seasons, they will increase the amount of eggs they lay to compensate for the loss at the hand of Mother Nature. As for the other hand at play, oil spills also threaten the survival of the marine iguana. From one oil spill in 2001, nearly 60% of marine iguanas perished on one island. Unlike the give and take balance of the El Nino current, the ocean oil spills offer no restitution. If it weren't for their incredible resilience to both natural and unnatural cataclysms, these lizards would no longer exist. Their life restricted to the Galapagos Islands were often marked with suffering and death, but their unique aquatic habits and their malleable existence has forever made them a biological centerpiece of the islands. A high wind takes the mottled shore by force its strength knocks a flock of fishing birds off course as they attempt to dive beak first into the plentiful waters of small fish below. High in the sky, they compromise with the direction of wind, allowing it to guide their hunt. Below them, a small winged bird waddles across the rocky shoreline, and with his turquoise eyes, he looks up into the sky and wonders how those birds of flight navigate the skies. Why do these brainless blue-footed birds have the mystical ability to fly while I'm stuck here, restricted to the shores? I have wings like them, and at least a brain of equal or greater size. This bug-eyed bird, a product of evolution, plods along the ground, forever wondering what it would be like to take flight. The flightless cormorant, having once arrived on the islands through the flight of their ancestors, over generations and generations of living on the Galapagos Islands, they have lost the ability to take flight. Rather than the process of evolution giving the species an ability to adapt, it has been taken away. Yet to offset this deficiency, they have become incredible swimmers. About 1,000 breeding pairs of the flightless cormorant live in the Galapagos. This endemic species evolved over the years, losing their need for flight as no major threat of predators exist on the shores of Fernandina or Isabella. Their wings became small and their feet became large, as swimming became their most efficient mode of transportation. As they swim the nearby ocean waters for food, their elongated necks reach incredibly far to pluck at passing eels and octopi, their favorite meals. Unfortunately for these birds, they have yet to develop waterproof plumage, so they are often seen along the shores drying themselves off in the sun. Not often do birds swim underwater, but within the strange biological enigmas of the Galapagos, survival dictates all. Not only is one rare species of flightless bird living among the Galapagos, there are in fact two. The other being the Galapagos penguin, a species of birds commonly assumed to desire the colder climates, yet have found its way to the equator of all places. 
They are in fact the only penguins on the entire planet that live north of the equator. How these birds combat the equatorial heat is yet another example of the Galapagos' wildlife's ability to adapt. They have developed small bodies, no more than 20 inches long, which allow the penguins to maneuver into small caves that remain cool despite the harsh equatorial sun. They also have the ability to pant, much like a dog, allowing them to release body heat. They share the same islands as the flightless cormorant, Bernandina and Isabella on the westernmost side of the Galapagos. The cool waters of the Humboldt and Cromwell currents bring the penguins nourishment of fish. Through their feeding strategy of diving up to 90 feet and attacking from below, schools of fish are more inclined to move towards the water's surface. In doing so, these penguins lend the hand to their fellow flightless cormorant, who don't dive quite as far. So the fish they drive upwards can be enjoyed by their neighbors. The penguins use ocean waters to eat and remain cool, and they use a shoreline to find suitable mates and eventually raise their young. Along the crashing waves of the shore, their identifiable calls can be heard, similar to that of a honking sound. Each a bit different than the last, they use their calls to identify their mates as well as their young. Similar to marine iguanas of the Galapagos, the flightless cormorant, and the Galapagos penguin are all threatened by the warm currents brought by El Nino. The reduction of food resources greatly affects all wildlife that has made the Galapagos their home. As natural as the current may be, and as much generational rebounding the wildlife can undergo, the effects of climate change can impact the strength of an El Nino event. These animals may have withstood countless changes in currents, yet as climates continue to change, the devastation brought by each event can increase in magnitude. If an event today can wipe out 70% of a species, imagine the potential aftermath of increased climate change. And as these species are endemic to the Galapagos Islands, this means that once they are gone from these shores, they are gone forever. As far as we should be concerned with the birds of the Galapagos, today we wouldn't understand much of anything if it weren't for the beagle's arrival to the Galapagos. Not the gentle hound dog with scruffy ears, mind you, but the 10-gun brig sloop of the British Royal Navy. This was the ship that brought Charles Darwin to the shores and allowed him to study the unclaimed wildlife of the islands. On its second voyage, setting sail in cold brackish waters of December 1831, the Beagle's class of ship had the reputation of a quote, coffin brig as these Cherokee class of sloops were known to handle poorly in torrential storms. Nonetheless, after refitting this ship with several upgrades, it would begin its five-year voyage across the seas. And upon its deck was the doe-eyed Darwin, a recent graduate, a young chap by every means, at the age of 22. With a youthful spirit in his heart and a curious love for beetles, he had not a clue as to what he would find along the journey. Common pictures of Darwin often depict an old, bald man, crotchety with a long white beard, unkept as any distinguished scientist should look, a bulbous nose and sad eyes. Yet at 22, imagine a man of youthful posture, a full head of hair, the wherewithal to journey across the ocean for years, and a young wrinkled brain ready to absorb the intricacies of the Galapagos. He was hired into the crew to become a geologist and a gentleman naturalist. Although Darwin was on his way to becoming a rural clergyman and only considered himself an amateur in the studies of geology, here another intervening fate continued to write the history of these islands. And with a quick change of career path, Darwin found himself aboard the ship, committed to a sea voyage of five years. Although due to his painful disposition to seasickness, he could rarely stand a moment being aboard. In fact, three out of the five years of the Beagle's voyage, Darwin would spend on land. This gave him a great excuse to avoid his seasickness, as well as study the natural world around him. And within only five weeks, Darwin would study these islands and further crack the code of evolution. The Beagle first arrived at the shores of the Galapagos on September 16th, 1835. They first stopped at the eastern island of San Cristobal, 
where Darwin's early assumptions of the islands filled with desert foliage and barren rock were met with a surprise, as he knows the vast and fruitful wildlife of the Galapagos. They were even against the scientist's best guess. Fatefully rich by the travel of bird poop, they had given life to the hardy trees and verdant highlands. Although famously, Darwin was known for his study of finches upon the Galapagos. It was on this island that he studied the famous San Cristobal Mockingbird. This would become the first bird to begin the extraordinary connection of evolutionary dots across a string of islands. Darwin was not alone in his studies, as he was influenced by many peers and scientists before him. But on this journey to the Galapagos, he was able to clarify the differences in appearance and behavior of the animals. With a keen eye, as a good gentleman naturalist he was, Darwin closely studied every rock, plant, and animal around him. Keeping an extraordinary amount of journals with him, he took careful notes and sketched every square inch of noteworthy evidence. Once they embarked to the island of San Floriana, it was here he noted the difference in mockingbirds. Slight changes in beak size and shape were the first of many recognizable differences in the birds from island to island, and every difference paired with the change in environment from the diet of what was available nearby to the geology of their surroundings. With the help of an English vice governor, Darwin also noted the difference in the shape and size of tortoise shells across the islands. These animals would undoubtedly become interchangeable with the popularity of the Galapagos Islands, and one of which would become a personal pet of Darwin's. It had unique differences depending on their surroundings. In the wetter highlands, the tortoises were much larger, sporting domed shells and shorter necks, whereas the tortoises found in the lower drylands were smaller carrying saddleback shells and shorter necks. As for a Galapagos species who has seen it all, the change of climate, the increase of human population in nearby villages, the reduction of their own species, living through the Great Depression and two world wars, and some may have even seen Darwin himself drawing sketches of mockingbirds in his notebook. The oldest Galapagos tortoise was believed to be 152 years old, and they have become the most recognizable animal trudging the leafy fields of the islands. In the early historical periods of the islands, when little was known about the ecological significance of the Galapagos, the tortoise population suffered a great loss at the hands of early whalers, merchants, and fishermen who landed on the archipelago between journeys and hunted these hard-shelled reptiles. From the scurvy pirates who used the islands to stash treasure and camp along the shores, to the boom of whale oil in the 19th century, the islands became havens of food and rest for many men sailing the seas, and tortoises became the most efficient delicacy once the sailors caught wind of their reserve. Adapting to the voyages out at sea, these animals developed a metabolism that allowed them to survive for up to one year without food or water. Ironically, this survival adaptation also made them more attractive to sailors since they could survive on boats for much longer, and slaughtered for fresh meat when supplies ran low. Their ample supply of meat could be easily stored and harvested for long journeys at sea. Turtle soup was a common meal of the time, and even Darwin himself ate a bowl of his own research subjects. From the 16th century to the 1970s, the Galapagos tortoise population lost an estimated 100,000 to the stomachs of hungry sea dogs. During these stopovers to collect tortoises for their voyages, sailors passing through the Galapagos had developed one of the most intricate forms of mail carrying in the early 1800s. On the island of Floriana, the same island the Crooked Watkins lived on in 1807, and where Darwin took note of the sheer lack of giant tortoises in 1835, a mail delivery system was set up around 1813. Homesick sailors wanted nothing more than to get a letter back to their loved ones on the mainland so a single barrel was set up on the island. They filled the barrel with letters meant for home, and the fishermen who stopped by the island would collect the mail on their way back to the mainland. This system continued into the 21st century, and thousands of letters continued to pass through the post office bay. A letter dated from the early 1800s may have said something along the lines of, Dear Martha, I hope this finds you well. Three years at sea might sound like a very long time, but I will be back before you know it, with a long and bristly beard to boot. Give my love to Jeremy as well. 
love William. P.S. Although my shipmates love it, I find this tortoise soup to be quite disgusting. Also, I seem to have forgotten the difference between a turtle and a tortoise, but I assume the turtle tastes better. They are the planet's largest species of tortoise weighing up to 475 pounds and growing up to four feet in size. They move with slow, meaningful strides and stretch their necks out to reach their food and to get to the best view of the path ahead of them. Although they are ironically slow-moving animals, they travel constantly in search of food. The familiar story of the tortoise and the hare isn't far from reality, as these tortoises travel long, consistent journeys across their islands. The long and enduring lives of these reptiles are quite simple. They sleep for up to 16 hours a day. When they awake, since they are cold-blooded animals, they bask under the warm equatorial sun, or slowly follow migratory patterns, always chasing seasonal rainfall to find the bright, delicious greenery of the highlands. They feed on grass, leaves, and cactus, and will travel for miles in search of rich vegetation. The El Nino event that often brings devastation to the coastal wildlife that depend upon aquatic nourishment works in vast contrast for the tortoise. As a warm current brings nourishing rainfall to the highlands of the Galapagos, while the iguanas perish in great numbers, the tortoises benefit from this seasonal change. Along with it follows the abundant vegetation, which incentivizes the tortoise's slow movement uphill towards the higher elevation of the islands. Yet, in recent years, their migratory travels have become more and more difficult with the expansion of human activity on the islands. An impressive 97% of the Galapagos Islands are designated as a national park. This includes about 3,000 square miles of land and 50,000 square miles of ocean. With all this protected land, the tortoises still struggle with human interference. It's not so much as the land being protected, but the pathways between these lands that are slowly barricaded. What was once a common migratory path of dirt and vegetation has become blocked by fences houses, roads, and walls. Year after year, as humans continue to occupy more areas of the islands, these tortoise pathways, which are crucial for their survival, are being continuously blocked. Not only is this a problem for the tortoise's search for seasonal havens of food, this also disrupts the ecology of the islands. Darwin once said, animals whom we have made our slaves we do not like to consider our equal. Considered the gardeners of the Galapagos, these tortoises' migratory pathways have become excellent real estate for new growth. As the giant tortoises bulldoze their way through tall vegetation, they knock seeds from various plants down into the soil, where now new spaces have opened up for the sun to reach newly sprouting plants. Their bushwhacking movement is also a gift to the island birds perched upon nearby branches. They watch closely as the tortoise tramples their way through the thicket, stirring up small insects in their wake so the birds can swoop down and catch them. The migratory routes of the Galapagos tortoise are not only critical for the tortoise's survival, but the cultivation of land throughout the islands. The beautiful greenery whose seeds were brought so long ago by the colonization of birds seeking a new home continues to be cultivated by its wildlife today. As the sun sets upon the islands, the last trace of light disappears beneath the horizon. A solitary boat makes its way to shore before darkness, as a swallow-tailed gull awakens from the crook of its nest. The thousands of twinkling dots of light once beaming from those shifting waves vanish along with the sun. And with patience, as darkness takes the sky, those thousands of twinkling lights seem to rearrange themselves up into the sky so far from the mainland and with little interference of light pollution the night sky above the galapagos thrives on a clear night of nights without seasonal rain clouds the mottled sky brightens as if a dimmable switch slowly flips the silhouette of nocturnal goals passes overhead on their way to hunt over the open ocean as black as night the milky way pulses with light above and the gentle hush of the ocean tides against the rocky shores pulses along with it. Here at the equator, 
A unique viewpoint allows you to see constellations from both the northern and southern hemispheres. A drinking gourd, a centaur with a bow and arrow, a hunter with a shining belt. The splash of seabird mimics the song of the tide. The swallow-tailed gull snatches a lonely squid from the water and carries it home. These endemic birds of the Galapagos are the only nocturnal gulls in the world. Its Latin genus name translates to hook for meat, as its hooked bill is perfect for fishing the dark waters. During the breeding season, their eyes become a bright red around the pupil, giving these birds a look of horror. And in order to hunt accurately in the dead of night, their eyes are much larger than any other gulls. And a layer of tissue at the back of their eye reflects light, allowing them to see much better in the dark. Another neighbor who eats at night who's much cuter than the red-eyed birds above with hooked bills and their laser precision of death. The Galapagos fur seal sleeps all day long upon the shores, and by night, much like the diet of the swallow-tailed gull, feeds on the oceans offering a fish, squid, and shellfish, a proper Atlantic cuisine. During their seasons of breeding, alongside this ever-changing dietary systems of the seasonal currents, in the wake of an El Nino event when aquatic life suffers dramatically, violence has a tendency to break out within fur seal families. They give birth to only one child at a time, and if food access is low during the suckling season of the first infant, their future younger sibling is going to have a rough time. Since the firstborn hadn't fed enough in their infancy, their weaning period is delayed, and if the mother gives birth during the next breeding season, the eldest will violently continue to hog the mother's milk. In these cases, 80% of the younger siblings will die. Cute as they may be, these fur seals are on the same quest to survive as every other creature. And when the warm currents might provide for species, such as the highland tortoises, the creatures who depend on a seafood diet struggle to survive. The ecological systems put into place by the island's progenitors both plant and animals alike, continue to resolve despite the constant confrontation of violent seasonal changes and the increased human activity currently facing the Galapagos wildlife. With so many endemic species that cannot and will not survive without the beautiful intricacies of the Galapagos and the complex ocean currents that deliver life and death upon the islands, this 17,000 square mile mythical hotspot of evolution an adaptation imprisoned to the remote archipelago of the deep Atlantic Ocean, whose creation was brought forth by the coincidental hand of Mother Nature, continues to be a testament to the journey of life itself. How simple were the beaks and feathers of a simple bird that cracked open the chronicle of not only their own natural process of adaptation, but our own. The beauty and complexity of the Galapagos serve as a mirror to her own existence on Earth, as well as the admonition of her own responsibility. And with that, that's the end of our journey to the Galapagos Islands for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Planet Sleep, and if you did, if you'd be so kind as to subscribe to us on YouTube and Apple Podcasts and follow us on Spotify, I'd really appreciate it. But until next time, on our next journey to somewhere on this beautiful, beautiful blue dot, sleep easy, my friends. <laughs>